Thank you everyone for joining our panel. I'm very pleased to be able to join you remotely. I wish I could have been there in person. Uh, that did not happen, but I hope that what I am going to present would, uh, would be interesting addition to the conversation that has happened so far. Uh, the case study that I'm going to present is an evaluation of an aquaculture value chain project in Bangladesh. TRIAI with its partner was the independent evaluation team. Um, the project itself was implemented by WorldFish. Let's start by talking about the project. The project was implemented by WorldFish in two districts of Bangladesh, Rangpur and Rajshahi. This is a complex project with multiple armed interventions and quite a diverse set of outcomes that the project wanted to influence. The name of the project is Increasing Income, Diversifying Diets and Empowering Women in Bangladesh. As I had mentioned before, it is being implemented by WorldFish with 3IE as its independent evaluation partner. The mandate of this project is to reach around half a million farmers, most of who would be smallholder farmers, with an aim to enhance aquaculture productivity, increase the value of marketed fish, enhance the quality, reach, efficiency, and sustainability of extension services. Additionally, the project had two other goals. One was to improve access to nutrient-rich foods, and the second, recognizing that women in fishing value chain are mostly invisible workers, the project aimed to bring women into fishing um, value chains, integrate them and move them up in the value chain and thus empowering them. The project aimed to do, do so through multiple interventions, often combined and layered with each other. The, the main interventions for, were uh, trainings on best practices on pond management and fishing. The project mobilized farmers into groups, of, into, into farmer groups, including women farmers groups. And of course, there were mixed groups and uh, imparted trainings on aquaculture best practices and management to these groups. The project also aimed to provide credit linkages to these groups link them to quality input supply like fish feeds, fingerlings, establish input and output market linkages, and a strong component of nutritional messaging. What was unique about this project and also the main diversity or the uniqueness of the evaluation also came in was the mode of delivery of the project. The project had a very clear mandate of stimulating the local private sector by training and building a cadre of extension workers called local service providers. These providers would be identified and trained in two modes. And this is where the evaluation design steps in. In some of the unions where of the, of the two districts where WorldFish would be operating, WorldFish would be involved in identifying the local service providers and imparting then with training, the local service providers would then go on, form the farmer groups. And through this channel, all interventions would be provided, trainings, credit linkages, and uh, input up and, and market linkages. The other model was where WorldFish formed partnerships with two large NGOs, TMSS and BRAC. Uh, WorldFish imparted training to these NGOs, these NGOs in turn were responsible for identifying the extension workers, training them, and through these LSPs, the, trade, the interventions would then uh, percolate to, to the farmer groups. And we made use of these two different modes of uh, project delivery to develop a randomized design to understand the impact of the program. RCT, a randomized controlled trial in which um, you know, we, we identified two treatment arms and one control arm. Some unions were randomly assigned to uh, for the direct LSP model or T1. The other was the hybrid model. The qualitative evaluation was always planned as part of the broader evaluation approach. But 
it became more and more important as the situation unfolded in front of us, as you would, as I'll come to in my later slides. Well, our first problem, of course, was that we were disrupted by COVID. While the project started in 2020, it just started before the first wave hit Bangladesh. The project implementation itself had to be dialed down with Worldfish trying to continue to reach out to farmers through online mode but uh, or remotely, but this was not a very intensive implementation phase. We could not do our baseline survey at all. So what we were able to manage was after the second wave, we went back to collect our baseline data. So implementation had started in some form much before the baseline. What we did to mitigate this was, of course, you know, that we had used our reference period as the aquaculture season before COVID, so which formed actually a very neat cut as pre, uh, pre-COVID as well as pre-program. The process evaluation was always integrated in the evaluation approach. Its initial scope was implementation fidelity to understand project context and the constraints and enablers of project activities. We also wanted to test the validity of the assumptions of the theory of change. As you can see from our theory of change, it was a very, very complex project with uh, with numerous outputs being linked to numerous interventions. And we embraced this complexity. What was important for us to also understand is which of the interventions given that there were multiple components or which combinations of these interventions were more effective and which were less effective and why. That was the scope we set out with. The methodology that we used for the process evaluation relied on data from um, a number of key informant interviews across various level of um, the implementation team. So not only individuals involved in the design of the program, but also the frontline workers. Um, We spoke with with donors. Worldfish created a large network of partnerships throughout the project uh, life cycle, uh, not only with TMSS and BRAC, but also with a number of commercial feed and seed companies, a number of microfinance companies, uh, banks, as well as marketing options uh, were set up. The project itself also aimed to work closely with government. All of these formed our our pool of key informants. We held FGDs with farmers who we divided by the scale of operation. So we spoke with farmers who had medium-sized operations while we also spoke with farmers who had small operations. And we had FGDs with women farmers. What we were very clear about doing was to collect data from both treatment and control areas, and within the control areas, speak with farmers who joined the program versus those that did not join the program. We knew the importance of the local service providers. They were really the agents who were implementing the project. So we started a phone-based interview of LSPs going, uh, you know, it would be a time series by which we would just go back to this. uh, We would try to track as many LSPs as possible over the period of project. What changed? Uh, In the next couple of slides, I will focus on giving a few examples of how the process evaluation strengthened the findings of the baseline report. So we are still away from the end lines. The end line would happen next year. What we did observe was using the quantitative baseline data, we observed many things about the context in which we were operating and about the theory of change that you know that needed more understanding that needed more un- more nuanced understanding the process evaluation helped us to do it precisely that and that's what follows in the next slides given that we were going into 2021 to collect the baseline data when the project had already started in some form alerted us to the fact that the randomization may not be neat. And indeed, looking at the baseline outcome values, 
across treatment terms, we found that there is, in most cases, the, we found baseline balance, which was not surprising given that, you know, one, we were, the reference period we were trying to elicit information for, from was before project implementation happened. And also because for the, up till the point where we were starting the baseline uh, data collection, the intensity of the project was quite slow. And many of the components that were planned had not really started. In spite of that, we observed some differences in baseline outcome values across treatment arms. For example, we found, as you can see from the two graphs, that T1 showed marked significantly higher level of fund productivity. And also households in T1 were more likely to be using commercial fish feed. In our RCT, you know, there may be a number of baseline values that may appear significantly different. It, it could just be a matter of chance, but we did not want to leave it to that. One of the things that we wanted to make sure in our process evaluation was to understand how well, whether the randomization was valid or not. When we collected qualitative data, we found no systematic variation in context or project implementation across the treatment arms. We also were able to validate that implementation till we had started the baseline uh, data collection had been mostly remote and low intensity, picking up only after the second wave of COVID. The delivery of the project in itself, in itself encouraged some form of spillover that, that could contaminate RCT. Uh, this is because LSPs were primarily free agents and uh, they were not bound to work in any village of their choice. They could work in any union. Uh, they could reach out to farmers across villages. This could mean that an LSP may be who was trained in either T1 or T2 union may well work in a control union, which may contaminate our RCT altogether. This was another, another issue that we wanted to understand in our uh, process evaluation and, in, and also in using the data from our phone-based survey. We were able to uh, verify that at least for the LSPs who had been recruited up to that point, most LSPs worked within their unions, but we also observed some interesting dif uh, differences in the operation of the, of the agents in T1 and T2. T2 LSPs, uh, the, and these are the extension workers who were trained by TMSs and BRAC, focused more on nutrition and gender trainings of fish farmers, while T1 LSPs who were trained by World Fish focused more on productivity trainings. There was also a difference in perception of LSPs about the aquaculture business altogether. T1 LSPs felt that it was somewhat risky or it was not very risky to be to be part of an in an aquaculture business while t2 uh, lsps felt that it was very risky as you can see from the blue bar these perceptions in itself could mean that could influence the outcomes that we see and the project uh, outcomes that we observe we also wanted to understand the nuances between some of the analysis that we had done of the baseline data. As I had mentioned before that one of the um, interventions that World Fish had was to train uh, farmers on uh, aquaculture best practices. In the baseline, we asked you know, fish, uh, male and female fish farmers if they are aware of certain um, aquaculture best practices. And we were very surprised to find that you know, awareness seemed really high. As you can see from the graph, it was almost 97, 98. For some, of course, they were lower. And uh, women, of course, had, had lower awareness in some uh, best practices compared to men. But did this knowledge translate to actual adoption of the best practices? Our process evaluation showed that there were significant differences in the adoption of best practices. And this difference was between the small pond owners and the medium-sized pond owners. 
while small fund owners had, had a lot less awareness about uh, best practices compared to medium fund owners. They, they, these were different, not only in awareness, but also in the actual adoption of the practice with respect to their own funds. When we tried to examine and understand what were the causes for uh, not actually not adopting a best practice as well. The other point that we were quite surprised, actually we were not surprised to see, was that most of our, of our respondents in the baseline data said that they could easily access credit if they wished to. This made us question if the credit mechanism, credit intervention, credit-based interventions would really be able to move the dial or not for the project. When we went into the field and had uh, the FGDs, we found that it's true that credit availability was high, microfinance credit was available, but that these credit were typically not for aquaculture. Also the microfinance uh, loan sizes were actually quite inadequate. There we did find that, that fish farmers and particularly medium-sized bond owners had a strong demand for bank credit. In this way, we were able to understand the nuances of the context as well. In the last few slides, I spoke about how the process evaluation strengthened the RCT, but the process evaluation in itself uh, was useful to our implementation partners. It was able to shed light on the targeting of the interventions, who to target for what interventions. It was able to uh, shed light on the quality of project implementation. It was able to uphold the validity of a number of key project assumptions and challenge a few more. And most importantly, we will be able to elaborate which intervention was working and which not from the package that was delivered. Overall, you know, this has been a very good learning experience for us on how to truly mix methods, how one type of method can actually support the other and vice versa. So um, I do think that uh, this makes a very interesting case to understand the importance of, of combining different methods of evaluation. Thank you very much.